Yo, what's going on, YouTube, and welcome back to Go Line Hockey. It's your boy, Kevin Forte, and we are continuing the Season Outlook series today as we take a look at the Colorado Avalanche. So, let's get right to it. So, we're going to take a look at some of the key departures for the Colorado Avalanche. And the good thing is, there's good news and there's bad news. Which one do you want first? All right, we'll go with the good news first. Well, the good news is they didn't have that many departures. The bad news, though, some of the guys that did leave the organization were kind of big losses. So we're going to start off with the guy that's the most irrelevant, but still a nice glue guy in the locker room, and that's Pierre-Edward Belmar. He was a nice guy in the bottom six for the Colorado Avalanche. He leaves the organization. Like I said, it's not a huge loss. But then the other guys, he doesn't look like anything. It's like you forget he even left because you're so worried about the other guys. And that's what I'm going to get to now. They lost some pretty key defensemen, two big ones. In fact, they lose Ryan Graves to the New Jersey Devils. It was a trade they made. They acquired a prospect and a draft pick. It was one of those things where Joe Sackick said, listen, we didn't want to give up Graves, but we knew that the Seattle Kraken were absolutely going to take Ryan Graves. And a team was willing to use up a spot on the roster, like the New Jersey Devils, which they had spots. They were able to protect Ryan Graves. Uh, they also traded Connor Timmins, the right shot defenseman, to the to the Arizona Coyotes. And they have since re-signed him in Arizona. So he's locked up there for the next two years. He was part of the Darcy Kemper trade, which we'll get into that saga here. But Connor Timmins was part of one of those losses. And then the biggest loss of the offseason for the Colorado Avalanche, the fattest L that they took, probably the fattest L in free agency, was Philip Grubauer. He is now a member of the Seattle Kraken expansion team. A huge, huge loss for Joe Sackick and the Colorado Avalanche. They were not willing to go to the $5.9 million per season threshold that Ron Francis and the Seattle Kraken were willing to give. Good on Grubauer. I remember watching him in Hershey with the Hershey Bears. He had, he let's be honest, he has one of the best last names in the NHL. And I remember watching him then and saying, this guy's going to be a really good NHL goalie. And Grubauer has turned into a pretty nice NHL goaltender, making $5.9 million per year. So that was a huge, huge loss for the Avalanche. And like I said, the biggest L of the offseason for them. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Now, looking at how they replaced some of those guys, they were able to keep Gabriel Landeskog, the captain. Yes, that's a huge piece. I didn't I didn't use him as an addition, but it could have very likely ended up like a Philip Grubauer situation, but I think Landy was way more attached to Colorado. The fact that he was, what, 19, 20 years old when he became the captain of the Avs, like, he has way too much in that organization, and it just makes sense. But Darren Helm comes into Colorado I think he's a great addition in that bottom six this is a guy that adds some depth and he kind of replaces a guy like Belmar he could play center he could play wing and he adds a little bit of grit and he could kill penalties for you Darren Helm is a guy that is going to be loved uh, by Jared Bednar because he just he's got all the little intangibles he's not there to score goals but he has the experience he was with Detroit with all those runs they were on in the late 2010s so Darren Helm a great addition there Mikhail Maltsev the best player in the NHL no I'm kidding uh he was traded in the Ryan Graves trade a nice pickup not a huge deal but again a guy that could fill out that bottom six uh in terms of depth he has more scoring potential than a guy like Darren Helm so maybe he could fill that role a little bit uh, they also added Kiefer Sherwood. I really liked him in Anaheim. Um, he just, he's got to get that scoring touch. And I think he's going to have that opportunity with a very high potent offense in Colorado. We'll see how many cracks at the can he gets. But Kiefer Sherwood was a guy I really wish the Ducks had kept. But again, it came down to the goal scoring. He was not able to score goals. And that's why they decided to move on from him. So we'll see if he gets that scoring touch. In the Mile High City, Ryan Murray comes in from free agency. He, you know, the New Jersey Devils kind of took a waiver on him last year. He turned into a pretty nice defenseman for the Devils. He didn't generate much interest at the trade deadline, though. No, they decided to keep him, and uh, he has moved on in free agency. Now, remember, on a cheaper deal for the Abs, and again to replace guys like Ryan Graves and Connor Timmins, 
that was kind of needed. They kind of needed Ryan Murray, a puck-moving defenseman, alongside Kale McCarr and Bowen Byram. Uh, moving on, we're going to look at Curtis McDermott, who comes in via trade. Talk about a puck-moving defenseman. He's not that. He's the opposite of that. Uh, he is a just big body guy. Uh, the LA Kings lost him in the expansion draft to the Seattle Kraken, and the Kraken flipped him for a fourth round pick. Seattle must have a lot of fourth round picks in this expansion next or in next year's draft. Uh, for a fourth round pick, Curtis McDermott just adds that little bit of sandpaper and size. He's one of the bigger guys in the NHL, so Curtis McDermott adds that that little bit of an intangible that they're looking for on the back end. Uh, you don't know how healthy Eric Johnson's going to be next year. He's kind of that guy that can be that kind of enforcer defenseman. Uh, probably even to more of an extent than a guy like uh, Eric Johnson was. And you, like I said, you look at their defense and we'll look at the lineup. But, you know, Curtis McDermott doesn't seem like a big deal now. But he could be a nice locker room guy as well. They also added Darcy Kemper, which he's not going to get a fair shake because of the amount that... Um, the amount that Joe Sackett gave up for Darcy Kemper, he gave up a first-round pick, Connor Timmins, and I think a second. I, I think they just gave up way, way, way too much. But unfortunately, that was the price for Darcy Kemper once the goalie market dried up. He was one of the only goaltenders left, unless you wanted 35-year-old goaltender Anton Hudobin. So, kind of a tough break there. Uh, but that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes, right? That's kind of how it works. Um but interesting there. Now, looking at their situation in terms of points, uh, obviously your top line leads the le leads the team in points. Rantanen, McKinnon, and Landeskog all led the team in points. Burakovsky, Makar, Kadri, Gerard, Donskoy, Taze, Brandon Saad, who has moved on. He is now a member of a division rival in the St. Louis Blues. Val Natushkin comes back. JT Confer. I want to see more from Tyson Yost. I remember watching him with a game at uh, MSG where North Dakota played Boston College. And I saw a lot of good things from Tyson Yost. He had a lot of poise with the puck and scored a couple goals. He just hasn't been able to find that touch in the NHL. So we'll see what happens for Tyson Yost. But... I'm hoping for some good things from him. Ryan Graves, again, that's a huge piece on that blue line that they lost. Belmar gone. Jacob McDonald, they're going to rely a lot more on him, especially now that Connor Timmins has moved on and Kyle Burrows, who is now in Vancouver. I thought he was kind of a, a big loss. Maybe Again, may not seem like it right now, but those are some nice intangible pieces on your blue line that the Avalanche have uh, kind of disposed of uh, here this offseason. And looking at their lineup, let's get to that before we call it a day. Um, so obviously you have one of the best lines in the NHL, Landeskog, McKinnon, and Rantanen returning once again. And I just noticed everybody's got a 9 in their jersey. Landeskog's 92, McKinnon's 29, Rantanen's 96. There's a little fun fact. There's really no meaning at all to that, but whatever. Now looking at... The second line, you've got Confer, Kadri, and Burakovsky. And I could see some of these guys on the third line jump into that second line very easily. Alex Newhook, a 2019 uh, first-round pick, could definitely end up in that conversation. He was drafted alongside Bowen Byram in that draft. Tyson Yost, again, I've talked to uh, Tyson Yost, Tyson Yost, Yost. I'm sure you guys will correct me in the comments. Uh, you also have Val Natushkin, who... He actually had a pretty good season last year with the Avs, so hopefully he's able to build on that with some of these younger guys. You have Logan O'Connor, Darren Helm, and Mikhail Maltsev rounding out the top six. Um, but again, it's one of those things. Losing Brandon Saad may actually hurt them a decent amount, but you're hoping that guys like Newhook and Yost, or Yost, whatever you want to call them, Newhook and Yost, develop where Brandon Saad's loss maybe isn't as bad. And that's kind of what I think Joe Sackick is expecting. He needs his guys to step up. That's really what it comes down to. And you look at their blue line. It's still a really good blue line. You have Devontae's and Cal McCarr as your top pair. Seven and eight numbers. I don't know how that worked out. Sammy Gerrard and Eric Johnson on the second pair. As long as Eric Johnson can stay healthy, right? That's That was a big issue last season. But worst case, you have guys like Ryan Murray and Bowen Byram, who Bowen Byram looked really solid last year for the Avs. 
He obviously had a little hiccups and bumps in the road a couple times. He was scratched. That's to be expected of a rookie. Uh, that's just kind of how it works. But I think another full season under his belt, Bowen Byram could be a huge piece. And if a guy like Eric Johnson and Ryan Murray have injury issues, it's going to give him more ice time and build up his confidence a little bit. And that may be the perfect transition for him into the top four on the Avs blue line. And then taking a look at their goaltending, you have Darcy Kemper and Pavel Francouz. Uh, you're expecting Francouz to be healthy because behind Francouz, you have what that uh, Lucas Johansson, the guy they got from Buffalo at the deadline. And you also have former Penn State goaltender, uh, Peyton Jones. So we'll see how that all unfolds. But uh, a pretty good goalie tandem, a pretty good defense, probably one of the still without Timmins and, and Graves, Still one of the best blue lines in the NHL. But what it comes down to on that defense is the health of Eric Johnson and a guy like Ryan Murray. Because once those guys go down, now you're relying on the Jacob McDonald's. You're relying on the, is that Chris Begris guy still there? I feel like he's been there forever. Um, but now you don't have guys like Kyle Burroughs. Like I said, Connor Timmins. So you're going to have to rely on other guys to step up. And I think the Avalanche, Joe Sackick, is confident that will happen. Definitely a huge blow losing Philip Grubauer because you look at not giving him that extra salary. They better give McKinnon a, a contract that he can't resist because they're so focused on keeping McKinnon, which I understand. But now when you think about it, to get Darcy Kemper in the grand scheme of things, you traded 900 k per year for the next six years, right? You traded a first, a third, and Connor Timmins right? That's pretty expensive. So like I said, Joe Sackick, he's been a very good general manager. He's kind of fleeced a couple teams. He really fleeced the Ottawa Senators and that Matt Duchesne trade. So it's one of those things, even the Islanders for Devon Tage, you gave up for a top pairing defenseman. You gave up two second round picks. I mean, not many teams pull the wool over Lou Lamorello. Uh, Joe Sackick may have done that last year. And you look at the return for guys like Brendan Dillon this year, who was two second round picks. Like, how does that happen? But at the end of the day, the Avalanche will get into the playoffs next year. I, I just don't know about the rest of that division. I mean, it's one of those things where the Avalanche can kind of dominate that division. We know last year in the, what was the, the Honda West division, it was like Vegas and Colorado. And everybody was talking about those two as the real juggernauts in that division, they don't really have that competition in their central division the way it's laid out now. You know, you have the Blackhawks who were abysmal last year. They added some pieces, but again, there's still questions there. And then you look at like teams like Dallas, Nashville, St. Louis, like where are they, right? So I think they get into the playoffs, but let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. Will the Colorado Avalanche make the playoffs? Will they win that central division? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. And if you guys like what we're doing here at Goal Line Hockey, want to see the latest news around the NHL and more videos just like this one, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and an even bigger subscribe down below. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching this video, and I will see you guys next time.